Hi, this is David Klass. I'm going to be reading today from my new book, Firestorm, the first book in a trilogy coming out soon from Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. This is a book that on the one hand is a lot of fun. It takes a teenage character and puts them through all kinds of hair-raising adventures. But on the other hand, it has a very serious environmental theme. We're doing a lot of damage to our Earth right now. What will be the result a thousand years from now? This book starts with the assumption that a thousand years from now, the earth is in very, very bad shape. And there's a battle going on, some people trying to save it, and some people who have other ideas. And the people trying to save it look back in time to see when the damage could have been reversed. What was the crucial turning point? And they choose our present-day Earth. And they come back to our Earth right now to try to save the world. And a teenage boy, Jack Danielson, growing up in a small town in New York who doesn't know anything about this at all, suddenly finds himself swept up in the middle of this battle to save the Earth a thousand years from now. In the section that I'm going to read, Jack has been driven from his home. He's been on the run with a dog named Gisco. He's been betrayed by this dog. A ninja babe named Echo has been beating up on him. She's trained him. She's educated him a bit about the environment. And as he's come to know her, he's noticed that she has a sad quality for all her toughness, a melancholy quality that he doesn't completely understand. And in this section that I'm about to read, Jack sees Echo on a rooftop at night. He climbs out next to her, and he talks to her for the first time, and he starts to understand what is going on both in the here and now and in the future a thousand years hence. I saw that lying dog, I mutter. Gisco. What's he doing snooping around? Why are you still angry at him? He just did his job. He brought you to me. Why do you care if his methods were a little dishonest? I don't know if you can understand this, I tell her, but when you're all alone and you start to be friends with someone and trust them, it's awful when they betray you. Don't pity yourself, she responds. From the moment we're born to the moment we die, We're all completely alone. Her voice quivers, and she stops talking. I glance at her face, and she turns away. What happened to your parents, I ask? Echo remained silent for such a long time that I'm sure she's not going to answer. Then she surprises me and says softly, They're both gone. I have no memory of my father at all, but I remember my mother. Searching for a hideout with her last energy, a hut, a cave, someone she could trust. She turned me over to the caretakers, and then she died. An owl hoots far off, strange hunting call, inchoate, primeval. We listen to its echoes fade. I'm sorry, I say. Now I understand why all my questions about my parents must have been painful for you. You don't understand anything, she snaps. Don't ever feel sorry for me. I glance over at her. Short black hair framing her features, an ebony shawl. Fingers cupped, as if the moonlight is nectar, she has collected in her upturned palms. Lips slightly parted, eyes wandering over the night sky. Echo, will I hurt your feelings if I tell you the truth? No answer. Is she listening to me, or is she far away? Sometimes I think you're the most heartless and mean psycho bitch imaginable, I say. And frankly, I hate your guts. Other times, I think you're the saddest person I've ever met in my life, and something of a soulmate. Echo gives a slight nod, as if both descriptions fit. It's very hard not to give in to the sadness, she admits, her voice so soft it seems almost like a confession. They tried to prepare me for it, warned me how hard it would be coming back this close to the turning point. 
but the irony is brutal, and the guilt is crushing. What turning point, I ask? Don't talk in riddles. Just tell me, what happened? You said this morning that humans ruined everything. How did we screw it all up? Echo slithers out of her lotus position, and I remember the eel emerging from its hole. I sense that meditation is her way of hiding in herself, sheltering from the world. Now she's exposed and vulnerable. She pulls her knees into her chest. For a moment she doesn't look like a ninja or a yogi. She looks like a girl at a campfire, about to tell a scary story that she knows will end up frightening her, too. If you really want to understand what I'm saying, remember that I'm looking backwards, she says. As we sit here, on this roof tonight, it's a thousand years in front of us. But forget that. Pretend it's all already happened, and now we have to deal with the result. Okay, I said. Take me to your world, and let's look backwards. Where are we ten centuries from this night? Echo looks up at the stars, inhales a deep breath through slightly parted lips. And then she does the last thing I would ever expect her to do. She starts quoting scripture, not just a line of it, but a whole ponderous chunk. My parents weren't exactly church-going types, but I know what she's reciting is famous, and I sort of recognize it. One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever, Echo whispers. The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to his place where he arose. The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done, is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. That's beautiful, I tell her, but awfully depressing. It's from the Bible, isn't it? Ecclesiastes, you find it depressing? Yeah, what it's saying is that there's no point to doing anything, because nothing really changes. To me, that's so comforting, she responds. How lucky people were to have had that to believe in. You're born, you live, you struggle, you die, and the earth goes on and on. The winds blow and the rivers run, and nothing a man does in life can possibly change a jot of it. And if you think you can leave a permanent mark or change the world, then you're vain and deluded, because that's the biggest vanity of vanities. Echo falls silent, and we sit side by side, looking out at the endless Milky Way, reflected in the inky bay. For a minute the stars seem to swirl and assume a ghostly shape. I see an old man looking back at me. He looks like Merlin the Magician, with long white hair and a shaggy beard. But his features are somehow familiar, and not in a creepy way, a comforting way. My features. He looks a lot like me, but so sad and bone-weary, mournful, like the weight of the world has been pressing on his shoulders for decades. He looks right at me, into me, through me. Is it my father, my real father? How can it be? And then he's gone, and I'm sitting there watching the reflected stars again, and somehow I now understand what happened. We changed it, I ask softly. That's why you say we're an appalling species. We damage the world. Permanently, she nods. Irreparably. Pollution, I guess. The ozone layer. Sure. Pollution. The destruction of the ozone layer. And a hundred other big and small ways all taken together. Hunted out the jungles. Fished out the rivers and the lakes and finally the deepest oceans. Cut down the rainforests. Destroyed the coral reefs, defoliated the edges of the deserts, changed climate patterns, 
manipulated the genetics of plants and animals, body blows to nature, one after the other, each one undoing millions of years of evolution and development, and do you know why we did it? No, I admit softly. Why? Because we're human, Echo tells me, and there's a ring of disdain and self-loathing in her voice. That's the reason. That's what humans do. That's what sets us apart from the rest of the animals. We think. We create. We try to control. And for a bunch of good reasons, like trying to create more farmland and feed more people and have insect-resistant crops and better weather, we played God more and more. And we couldn't do it. We weren't up to it. For days she's been stingy with her words. Getting her to say anything has been such an effort. Now the truth spills out of her in an angry torrent. We mucked it up, she says bitterly. So instead of there being no new thing under heaven, suddenly everything was new. Instead of nothing ever changing, everything was different. A thousand years of hothouse changes at an ever-accelerating pace. And those changes were not for the better, I guess? Not at all, she agrees and shudders. She closes her eyes and presses her knees to her chest, and I get the strong vibe that the future world is not a pretty or a happy place. Most of them were horrible. The earth, stripped of beauty, barren and desiccated, water holes and pockets of green like oases in an endless desert, people fighting over food, energy, and resources, and not just people but things. We created our own nightmare, and now it's swallowing us up. So that was it. That was the mess a thousand years in the future. And the ironic thing was, that was my messed up world she was talking about, even though it was a world I didn't know. And this world, of blue skies and herons and wild horses, was not my world, even though it was a beautiful planet Earth I had always taken for granted. Didn't anyone see what was happening and try to stop it, I ask, my own voice now sounding a bit sad. Yes, she nods, even today a few people see. They're regarded as fanatics or alarmists now, but in the far future they're looked upon as visionaries. As things got worse and we approached and passed the turning point, more and more people saw what was happening. Movements sprang up all over the world, trying to prevent what was seen with increasing clarity as mass suicide, our species dooming itself. Over centuries, the movements merged into one coalition, one, she searches for a word, global effort to save the earth. Did this movement have a name or a leader, I ask? Something in Echo's voice I haven't heard before. Respect, even reverence. Its founder was a great man, a philosopher scientist named Dan. People who followed him came to be called caretakers, or the people of Dan, and his descendants, the House of Dan, led the struggle to save the world. My whisper comes very low. My name's Jack Danielson. You are of the House of Dan, she tells me a great legacy, and a tremendous responsibility. Your ancestors saw that the earth could be saved only if people changed every destructive and indulgent habit. We had to stop being consumers and corruptors and start being caretakers and restorers. It was an all-consuming way to live, to act, to think. I myself have followed it since my mother left me with the people of Dan. That was her parting gift to me. At least she had a good reason for leaving you, I mutter. Mira wasn't dying. How could she just send me away? Echo smiles. Third smile. This one affectionate and tinged with sadness. How indeed. She lets her question hang in the night air. Enough questions for one night. Just one more. You still haven't told me what the turning point is. I remind her. Echo is clearly tired, but she gathers her strength. 
It's the name we gave to the moment when the damage to our earth could still be reversed, she explains. It's impossible to pinpoint a day, or a week, or even a year, but there was a time up until which all this beauty could have been preserved, the damage could have been contained and rolled back, and then there was a turning point when things spiraled wildly out of control. After that, it became much more difficult. We still tried. We fought. But it was too late. It's hard to come back so close to the turning point, to see it when it could have been reversed, to think what might have been. She falls silent. I am silent also. Hello? I'm talking with David Klass, the author of Firestorm, which is book one of the Caretaker Trilogy. David, this is your first time writing in the science fiction dark fantasy genre. It seems like a big departure from your other novels. What led you in this direction? Yes, it is a bit of a departure. It's the first time I've written a book with science fiction and fantasy elements. And I'd like to stress that I don't see this as a sci-fi or a fantasy book. It does have those elements, but I see this as a very realistic novel that deals with some serious questions about our environment and that also I hope is a lot of fun. I think it's a fallacy that the author chooses his book. In a lot of my work, and particularly with my best books, like You Don't Know Me, a character or a story chooses me, and I find myself at the mercy of that character. And that was certainly the case with this trilogy. I really didn't set out to write a sci-fi book or a fantasy book, but I heard the voice of Jack Danielson, a very smart, interesting, fun boy who wanted me to tell his story. And at the same time, there was a story that I wanted to tell about our Earth and how I think it's in danger. And the only way to tell it was with these elements. So it really wasn't me saying I want to write a sci-fi book. It was me saying I want to tell this story, and this is the only way to tell it. But there's one other thing I would add, which is even though I really haven't written in sci-fi or fantasy before, it does come a little bit naturally to me. I have it in my family background. I sort of grew up with it. My father, Morton Class, was an anthropologist, but in his early days, he was a science fiction writer and an editor for years at Astounding Magazine. And my uncle, Philip Class, writes under the name William Ten and is truly one of the world's great living science fiction writers. So I sort of grew up with this, and when I started writing this book, found that it was a little bit part of my family legacy. The crux of the Caretaker trilogy is that Jack must save the Earth before the turning point the point at which the environmental damage we've done to the Earth is still reversible. Why did you choose to write a trilogy to cover this issue? Or should I ask, what possessed you to tackle such a huge subject? Well, the answer is a very personal one. I have two small children, a son who's five, a daughter who's three. They're truly the delights of my life. And I worry, I brood sometimes about what kind of a world we're leaving for them. You know, I have very distinct memories. I'm not sort of a lifelong rabid environmentalist. I have very distinct memories of fishing for cod with my father, of catching fish in lakes all over the East Coast and eating them. And recently, I was sent on a movie project to Newfoundland, uh, which I knew was sort of the home of the world's great cod fleet, and there were no more cod there. And when I visit lakes all over the east, uh, there are frequently signs posted saying you can't eat the freshwater fish anymore. So on a very personal level, I worry. Um, if we don't take care of our planet, not a thousand years in the future, as uh, I describe in this book, but a lot sooner than that, what are we going to hand over to our children? So that was really sort of the, the very personal thing that got me started wondering, well, won't they be angry at us? What will future generations think of us? We had the wisdom. We had the knowledge. We had the power to stop what we're doing. Why didn't we do it? Imagine if they could come back here and confront us. 
Imagine if they see this as the crucial turning point and we let them down. And that was really what got me started on this trilogy. In Firestorm, which is the first book in the trilogy, Jack must save the oceans. It's obvious that you did a lot of research about fishing in general and bottom trawling in particular. Can you tell us how you went about it? Yes. Um, I started off by trying to sort of give myself a little bit of a general education in environmentalism. I went back to Silent Spring, a Rachel Carson's great book. I looked at a number of books on the ocean, like Richard Ellis's book, The Empty Ocean. And then I started to sort of zero in on bottom trolling, deep sea fishing, species that were endangered. And I found that the, by far the most valuable resource to me was the Internet because the global environmental movement seems to be a very tech-savvy group, and virtually everything that I needed to know I could find online. I talked to a number of scientists, and Greenpeace was instrumental in unlocking that world to me and in introducing me to a number of top marine scientists who have spent their lives studying the oceans and the coral reefs, um, professors like Dr. Elliot Norse and Dr. Les Watling. And finally, the uh, most difficult part of researching this novel was actually finding someone who had worked on a fishing trawler, worked on a deep-sea fishing trawler, which is sort of a dangerous closed world, and would be willing to talk to me about the specifics of what it's like to trawl, how the mechanics of it actually work. And those scientists were able to make that introduction, and that was absolutely invaluable to me. And how did you happen to choose an island near the Azores for the final showdown in Firestorm? Well, I had sort of a profile of what I knew I needed, and it was very difficult to find. A uh, Jack is blown in a small boat off the outer banks of North Carolina by a hurricane. Uh, I knew he would be sort of traveling for a few days to a week, and there was only a certain distance that he could go. I knew I needed a location that was near a coral reef. I knew I needed a location where it would be believable that they would be trawling for a very valuable species of fish, and I settled on the orange ruffy. I wanted a place that had good diving, and finally I wanted a place that had, had volcanic mountains in great natural beauty. So that was sort of the profile that I was looking for, and I ran it by each one of the scientists that I talked to. And one of them, I believe it was Dr. Les Watling, said to me, I know exactly where you want to set this, the Azores. And then I went online, looked up the Azores, and everything sort of fell into place. Greenpeace, which has endorsed the novel, has dedicated the year 2006 to defending our oceans. What can those of us who don't have your hero's superhuman powers do to help the oceans? Well, a few things, and I think that they sort of take place on different levels. Just on a personal level, I think everyone can sort of do a little bit to try to help. They can alter their diet. I know that I have. They can look at certain delicacies, certain things that they love to eat from the oceans, like caviar or Chilean sea bass, which are really Patagonian toothfish, and they can say, yes, I like them, but they're practically extinct, so I have to stop eating them, and maybe I have to tell my market, the place where I buy them, that they really shouldn't stock them anymore. So that's sort of one thing on a personal level. On a slightly uh, more active level, people can get in touch with their legislators, their senators, their congressmen, and say, this is an issue that I care about, and we have to do a better job of managing our fisheries and of setting aside marine resource conservation centers. On an even more important level, there is a real global fight going on. It's not just sort of in my novel, but it really is going on between people who see this as a huge problem threatening future generations and between countries and businesses who are really interested in making money and consuming. And the organization that I see leading this global fight is Greenpeace International. Uh, they've made this their year of the ocean. And if people want to find out more about it, they can log into the website www.defendingouroceans.org. That's www.defendingouroceans.org to learn about this, 
to see if they want to join and become ocean defenders, and to follow, Greenpeace has sent a boat around the world to all the different ocean's hotspots, and people can follow the progress of this boat and really become involved in this issue. What other research did you embark on to create this world where now intersects with a thousand years from now? For instance, you had to deal with time travel. Yes, this really scared me. I had never before written a book with sci-fi elements and particularly time travel. And as I began to realize, when you start reformulating the rules of the universe as a writer, you can really paint yourself into a corner because you can postulate rules in the first book of a trilogy that when you get to the third book of the trilogy prohibit you from resolving your story. And specifically, there are a number of problems with time travel that every writer who's written about it is aware of and that scientists, including Einstein, have puzzled over for decades. For example, there's the grandfather paradox, which says if you go back in time and you kill your grandfather before your grandfather has met your grandmother, then on the one hand, you could have never been born. But on the other hand, you were the one who went back in time to kill your grandfather. So as I began to ponder these paradoxes and to sort of apply them to my own story, I got more and more frightened. One day I was leaving my office and I mentioned to my superb research assistant, Christine, I said jokingly, Christine, I can't seem to solve this problem. I think I need to talk to the smartest person in the world. And I came back on Monday and she said, okay, I've gotten you 30 minutes with the smartest person in the world. He turned out to be a physics professor, the chairman of the department at one of the best universities in America. He'd written 60 books on very esoteric subjects of theoretical physics. And uh, he's really considered to be on the short list for a Nobel Prize. And he consented to talk to me for 30 minutes about the time travel problems in my book. And because I do a lot of work for Hollywood, I frequently have to interview experts and celebrities, and I'm not usually intimidated. But as my conversation with this gentleman got closer and closer, I got more and more scared. I thought of, I have a limited background in science. I haven't formally studied physics since high school. I do sort of read popular books on science. What would this great mind, this man who is trying to understand the universe in 12 different dimensions, make of my own facile attempts to sort of put things together and make sense of them? I didn't sleep the night before the phone conversation. I was so nervous. And I woke up and it was... I was really a nervous wreck. I didn't know what I was going to say to him, and I didn't know what he would make of me. And as I was going out the door, I saw my five-year-old son, Gabriel, and I said, Gabriel, today your father is going to talk to one of the smartest men in the whole world. What should I ask him? And Gabriel said, without hesitating for a moment, ask him if he can fix our DVD machine. <laughs> and I thought this was funny, so... When I actually got the great scientist on the phone, I told him this story to break the ice. Well, he didn't laugh. He didn't even give me an appreciative chuckle. He just looked back at me and said, tell me your background in general relativity and quantum theory. And I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> well, you're dealing with enormous and very intimidating subjects in this book, but the remarkable thing about Firestorm is that it's such fun to read. It's a page turner. The pace is breakneck. It's 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 explosive. One might describe it as a young adult novel with the pulse of a Hollywood action movie. I know that you double as a film script writer. Do you think your two lives as writer come together here? I hope so. Um, I've had a strange double career. On the one hand, I've written more than a dozen sensitive coming-of-age stories for young adults. And on the other hand, I've written more than 30 action movie scripts for the different studios. Movies like Kiss the Girls, starring Morgan Freeman and Ashley Judd, Desperate Measures, starring Michael Keaton and Andy Garcia, and most recently, Walking Tall, starring The Rock. And... 30 of those scripts adds up to a lot of fist fights, 
car chases, you name it. And I wanted to try to combine these two careers. I wanted to write a book that on the one hand was a sensitive coming-of-age novel with an interesting teenage protagonist, and on the other hand, that would really appeal to a mass audience and would really have the thrill